Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better at veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, inv. So ivdi. International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash INV, and we'll get you the information that you need. Do you recommend electrosurgery for cases of gingival hyperplasia? Again, excellent question. I'm glad you asked this, and I have a very relevant case that we did um, just uh, two months ago in our Orlando practice that... Um, Electrosurgery was used for gingival excision. And unfortunately, this happens more often than not um, because of the heat created. And this was done in only one area of the mouth where there was most likely a, a mass there and they used electrocautery. Two weeks following the procedure, there was an odor and uh, active pus and uh, this is what the area looks like. What you're seeing there is number one, the gingival tissue was more or less destroyed, as well as the bone underneath. That's necrotic bone that we're seeing. And that fourth premolar is discolored. Because of the heat that was created, the fourth premolar was compromised. The pulp was heated to a temperature where it died and became inflamed and um, and so we see discoloration. So this particular patient um, uh, fortunately was just one area. We extracted those two teeth, uh, excised all of that necrotic bone and then um, excised that gingival margin and brought healthy tissue down to close that area. Um, and this is more what we see with electrosurgery because of the heat that's created. You have to be so careful um, and, um, and not damaged. So we just don't recommend that. Um, Dr. Beckman um, uses a scalpel to remove the majority of that tissue, just using it um, to excise right at the gingival margin. And then he'll use a particular burr. It's called a 12-fluted burr to contour that um, gingival margin to give it what's called a beveled edge so that it, um, it heals normally. And so there's, um, this has been the technique he's used for 30 years and um, we have tremendous success um, without um, compromise um, to the patient. Are you charging for each post extraction x-ray in each quadrant that is getting a regional block? Yes and yes. We charge, we have our full mouth series code in, and then we have dental radiograph additional. So each additional post-op x-ray is getting charged for, and then the regional blocks are charged per quadrant. So the most we would ever charge for regional blocks would be four quadrants. That would anesthetize the whole mouth. Or if we're just doing one quadrant, we would just charge for one regional block. What is the thought of using gel foam Vetspon, which is a hemostatic agent, in place of a tooth when extracted specifically for canines, carnasials, or lower molars? Not necessary. The blood clot that is left behind is the best bone graft that we can leave in that alveolus post-extraction. The only time we use a hemostatic agent is when there's emergent bleeding there was a artery or a larger vessel that was nicked and we get pretty good you know bleeding aside from and in addition to normal bleeding that you're going to see during oral surgery so we use um, 
Curazorb, which is a calcium alginate, um, comes in um, a sheet, kind of like a, a netting that we pull off pieces and kind of stuff in there for, for hemostatic um, if needed, but not for every extraction, no. Um, the blood clot itself that's left in there is the best bone graft um, that we can do. There's no reason to leave anything in that extraction site. Um, and we see post-op rads all the time and when these patients come back for follow-up visits and um, that bone fills in um, fine without any of that. How long does the wind-up state usually last? Do you give ketamine initially to calm the patient and what medication is used in the CRI? Good question. Um, the wind-up state can vary based on what um, is going on with the patient. It can happen is in as short as an hour of uncontrolled pain, and it will last until these patients are treated. So sometimes they can be in wind up for you know weeks to months, especially these, these stomatitis patients. So when we admit these guys, they go on a CRI of buprenorphine and lidocaine for our cats. For dogs, we use hydromorphone, lidocaine, and ketamine. And they are giving, uh, given a loading dose um, of ketamine and uh, the narcotic uh, so that that can get on board right away. And our calculator um, will help us with that. Uh, the website is the veterinary anesthesia support group.org. And I will place that in the chat here so you guys have that. Um, and what that is, is um, a website that will um, give you a lot of information with regards to managing pain, as well as um, all of the CRI calculators. So if you go into that site, go into pain management, and then there's a, a side menu, um, navigate to CRI, and there's a file that you can click and drag right onto your desktop that has emergent drug CRIs, syringe infusion um, drugs, as well as analgesic CRIs. So really, really nice resource for, uh, for pain management. Uh, a question about what pain meds we typically send home where NSAIDs are contraindicated. Uh, we are gonna use uh, most likely uh, fentanyl and uh, gabapentin together. Those two, um, when we cannot use an NSAID, uh, work really nicely together. How do you feel about fluoride treatments? Um, fluoride has not really been shown to have a significant benefit for our canine or feline patients. So we, um, we do not use fluoride in our practice currently. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash inv.